let me ask you this, and I, I'm going to ask for a show of hands, and mine's going to be the first one to go up. How many of us have done something really silly or really stupid with money? Really silly or really stupid with money? Yeah, yeah. Well, we've got some honest people here. Uh, the fact is that if you've done anything silly or anything stupid with your money, you know what that makes you? It makes you over 12 years old. Because we all do something silly and we all do something stupid with our money. Now, if we're struggling with money, if our bills are piling up, if we're worried about retirement or college expenses or even paying the electric bill from month to month, guess what? You're normal. You're absolutely normal. Welcome to the club. Normal North America is broke. Most people in North America are broke. And that's really what we have to deal with. We have to deal with the reality that as Christians, Satan wants us to struggle. And if finances is, uh, becomes a tender spot, he is going to use that so that we will be feeling pushed back and pushed into corners and we'll just have nothing but guilt and shame about the way we have misused our money. Satan is a predator. And when he finds something that he can chomp on in a Christian's life, he is going to chomp hard. And uh, he knows if he can take us out, he's going to try to do it. That's why money problems consistently rank among the leading causes of divorce in North America. That's why college students all over the nation are carrying record high credit card balances and debts and student loans. That's why bankruptcy continues to run rampant in this country. The Office of the United States Trustee reports that over a 10 year period from 1998 to 2008, Get this, there were 14,347,244 bankruptcy filings in the United States of America. There were 14 million bankruptcy filings from 1998 to 2008. Now the problem really isn't the money. The problem uh, is a lack of hope. The problem is we have become bad and poor stewards of what the, uh, God has given us. We do stupid things. Sometimes when we do stupid things, we'll blame other people when we do those stupid things. It's someone else's fault. It's not my fault. It belongs. The reason I'm in this mess is because someone else wasn't listening to me. Or someone else wasn't doing it the way I thought it should be done. But when we do stupid things, we deal with some pain. And there's a real reality in life, and that is the fact that pain is a teacher. Pain is a teacher. Pain shows up when when uh, things go wrong. And when pain shows up when things go wrong, it tells us that we need to make something right. If you are hurting, and you hurt long enough, and you can't feel like your body is getting better from the physical pain it's going through, what do you do? You finally and you eventually go see a doctor. Because the pain is a signal that something's wrong and it needs to be corrected. And with our finances, Pain can make us open a Bible. Pain can make us turn to God. Our behavior is the key. Dave Ramsey says that personal finances is 80% behavior and only 20% head knowledge. In other words, it's how we handle and behave with our money and not what we know about it. So, how do we need to behave in order to get our finances in line with God's way of handling money. Do you think God is trying to teach us that there's a certain way of handling money? Some people say, well, I don't know. You know, the Bible, it's ancient. You know, they were, they, they, they were trading uh, uh, for things uh, with livestock back in Bible times. I, I'm not sure that it really would help us in today's economy. It's so complex and so different. Well, not really. Not really. We need to understand that there uh, are over 800 scriptural passages about money. In the Bible, over 800 times, God speaks about money. Jesus, in his teachings, spoke more about money than he did on any other topic, including heaven, or hell, or temptation, or sin, or salvation. 
He spoke about money more often. And so, clearly, money is a big deal. But sometimes people in church get confused about this. Now, I, I want you to be honest. If you knew that you'd be coming here tonight for this church service, and that this message was going to be about money, how many would say, oh, great, I don't want to hear the preacher talk about money. That's what churches do, is talk about money, don't they? In church, sometimes we think that a sermon on money is a plea for more giving. But for Jesus, a sermon or a teaching about money was a way to prepare people for a godly life. Because he knew how much money rules people's minds and hearts. He wants God to rule our minds and hearts. And so a good understanding of the godly principles of money help us to keep our priorities in check. There's an old saying that says, show me your checkbook and I'll show you what's important to you. Well, it could be your, your debit card statement now. It could be what you use to put on the credit card. In a sense, what we use our money for is a window into our soul. If our money goes for things that don't have any lasting joy, then we need to understand that that's telling us that our lives don't have a whole lot of lasting joy. The Bible doesn't have to be complicated, and it doesn't have to have hard to understand formulas on how to deal with money. What the Bible teaches about money is really very easy to understand. It's just really hard to do. It's because our behavior. It, it goes against what we want to do. When we get a little bit of cash in our hands, we want to spend it. We want to use it for us. But the Bible has some very clear teachings. If we can get a control of the person that we see in the mirror, we can be in control of our money. If we are not in control of the person we see in the mirror, we'll never be in control of our money. We'll never be good stewards. So I want to take a look at Dave Ramsey's five biblical principles for dealing with money. And these are his basic principles in his Financial Peace University classes. In your uh, bulletins, if you grab the bulletin, there is a, a section there that has uh, the basics of biblical finance, and there's some blanks there. And you'll see the, uh, the words up here on the screen in just a moment. These are the five basics of Bible finance, according to Dave Ramsey. Number one, we need to get out of debt. And, and uh, the scripture reference that Dave uses for that is Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. You'll notice that there's a number of these in Proverbs because there's a lot of wisdom in the book of Proverbs on uh, dealing with everyday issues in life. Proverbs chapter 22, and verse 7, says this, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is the servant of the lender. The borrower is the slave of the lender. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. He said you cannot serve both God and money. Jesus was very specific there. He was, in, in context, he was speaking about how money rules people's lives. And he said, if you want to follow God, you can't let money be your Lord. God needs to be your Lord. We need to imagine what our lives would be like if we were debt free. How much could we do? What could we accomplish? What could we do for our families? What could we do for God? What could we do for this church if our lives were debt free? You see, we need to work at getting out of debt. Sometimes people get confused and they think they need to borrow money for what God would want them to do. But if God is calling us to do something, He will provide the way to do it. I believe that. Let me give you another personal illustration from my own life. When we came here four years ago, we're in our fifth year here already. Believe it or not, I've been up here, this is our fifth summer with you. When we came in 2010, the Sunday that I preached my trial sermon, I was one week away from having no pay whatsoever. One day, no pay. I was 
right at the very end of, uh, of the, the, the limits that I had with the church that I was leaving. I wasn't sure up until the time that we were invited to come for the trial sermon where I would be. I was willing to go wherever God wanted. But I was one week away from, from my last paycheck. We were asked to come. It took two weeks for us to get here. In the interim time, having received that one paycheck, there was a week where there was no pay. Bob Russell Ministries, out of the blue, sent me a check for $1,200. We didn't ask for it. We didn't uh, uh, contact him in any way. But evidently, Bob had heard that I was in that predicament. And uh, he, has, he has a benevolent agency or some people that are willing to give to people who have needs. And that $1,200, more, much more than, than, uh, than the paycheck I was receiving at the time for two weeks, uh, came and provided the funds and the means we, we needed for some of the extra expenses for us to move here. We didn't miss a week. If God wants us to do something, He will open the doors, and He can kick them wide. So we've got to understand the first principle of biblical finance, so that we are not the slaves of the lender, is to get out of debt. The second principle of biblical finance, and I like the way that Dave Ramsey says this, he says, act your wage. Not act your age, but act your wage. And for this, he referred to uh, Proverbs 21, verse 20. And there it says, In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all that he has. In the house of, of, in the, house of the wise are choice stores of food and oil. And we need to understand what we have. Paul told Timothy this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. He said, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Paul also told the Philippians that he had learned to be content. He had learned the secret of life and the secret of joy. He said, I have learned to be content in all things. He said, I know what it's like to be uh, well off. And I know what it's like to be in poverty. But he said, my strength comes from the Lord. And he was content in all things. We've all done things that just make us feel stupid. We've all done things where we've made mistakes. But if we can learn to live on what we make, we can live lives of peace. We can act our wage. So we need to get out of debt. We need to act our wage. But then we need to get on a budget. And you know, that's one of the hardest things. Uh, it's been a hard thing for me over the years to discipline myself to say that I will have a household family budget and I'll stick to it. Uh, we always find reasons not to. But over in Luke chapter 14, verse 20, in Jesus' teachings, he said this. He said, um, you know, that's probably not what I was looking for. I'm going to have to double check that one. Uh, huh, it's not. It's, 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 a, it's a, a mistake there. The, the passage that I was looking for, and maybe if you could spot it, if it's around there, uh, I don't see it, but it's the passage, not to correct that for tomorrow morning. Uh, the passage is, uh, if you're ever intending to build a tower, do you not sit down first and count the cost to see if you have enough money to finish it? I went to Luke 14.20, and uh, Luke 14.20 says, uh, I just got married, so I can't come. No wrong verse. <laughs> just it didn't fit in well. But the, the point that, that Jesus was making in this other parable or this other story is if a, if a king is going to go to war and he finds out that the opposing king has an army that is multiple times larger than his, will he not work for conditions of peace before they go to battle because of the certainty of him losing if they go to battle? Or if you're going to build something that would be very expensive, and in Jesus' day it would have been a big tower and say, wouldn't you first sit down and count the cost? Because if you can't finish it, your tower will be a laughing stock. 
1428. Yeah, 1420 is what I had. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it's good for folks just to read, read through because uh, I, I just I just wrote it down wrong. Yeah, there it is. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower, will they not first sit down and estimate the cost he has, uh, if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and he was unable to finish. And then he told the story of the king. Suppose a king had to go to war against another king. Will he not first, down and first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he'll send a delegation. While the other is still a long way off, he'll ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. So there it is in the lists of Jesus in his heart sayings. Giving up everything to be his follower. We need to understand how important it is to get ourselves on a budget to, to take a look at things. Uh, sometimes, sometimes people will make a decision, and then after they've made the decision, then they'll go to God and say, God, I want you to bless this, because this is certainly what you want, isn't it? When in fact it's what they want, and they're trying to drag God into it. I've seen that happen so many times. God, this is certainly from you, and in fact, it really is what I'm thinking and what I would like. We do the stupid thing sometimes, and then we turn around and we say, okay, God, you're going to bless us, right? In Luke 16, 10, Jesus said, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. He's talking about money there. A loving father is only going to give his children what they can handle, and that's what God does for us. Uh, we need to understand that uh, when our children get learner's permits and they start driving, we're not just going to hand them the keys and tell them to go down the interstate to St. Ignis and pick up something for us and come back. It's too much for them. No, we, they start out small. They start out, hey, yeah, yeah, you're not going to do that right away, Jayla. <laughs> It starts out small, and it starts out easy, and it starts out simple, and it starts out with, with, a, with a parent or with the driving instructor sitting in the front seat beside the teenager. And then the teenager, as, as that teenager learns and becomes more responsible and gets it, then more driving is, is, is available. But that's just, that's just the plain, plain common sense. We will... Give our kids what they can handle, and God does the same with us. We need to be responsible. We need to put our plans down. We need to be on purpose. And we need to try to do this before the month begins. I still struggle with budgets. I always have. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm never ashamed or afraid to tell you when I'm struggling, too. So don't look at me and think, oh, he thinks he's got it all together. Uh -uh. No, it's, it's, it's that this is the one area that's always going to struggle for us. But we need to agree with our spouse, too. We can't just turn around if we're married and say, this is what I'm going to do, and sorry, but this is it. There's no money for groceries, because I budgeted the rest for the bills. You've got to be reasonable about things, and you've got to work together. And so we need to get out of debt. We need to act our wage. We need to get, you know, get on a budget. Fourth, we need to save, and we need to invest. Again, in Proverbs 21 20, uh, we have the, uh, uh, the same passage that we looked at earlier when we were talking about acting our wage. Let me go back to the Proverbs here. I'm not marking my passages, so it just takes me a moment to get to it. Proverbs 21 20 again says, in the house of a, of a wife who stores a choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all that he has. We need to work at not devouring all that we have. Uh, Dave Ramsey says this, you cannot out-earn stupidity. If we make stupid mistakes, we can't earn our way out of stupid mistakes. We need to be saving money. And Ramsey gives some different ways of doing it. He says that we need to make an emergency fund. Fund. Not fun, fun, an emergency fund. Uh, how many remember their grandparents or someone else say, you know, it's always smart to save for a rainy day. You ever hear that old phrase? Yeah, yeah, and it is, it is. Life is going to come at us and we need to be ready. And so 
uh, we need to have some money set aside for those emergencies so we can handle them. We might think we're budgeted and everything's just fine, but we're not anticipating the furnace blowing up in the middle of winter. And if the furnace blows up in the middle of winter, we've got to have some source of being able to help ourselves make those repairs or replace that unit. We need to save up and not use credit. Instead, pay cash. Why? Why? You know, we live in a credit card society. We don't live in a cash society anymore. You know, there's very little actual dollar bills exchanged in the cash registers. But if we use cash, we spend less money. You realize that? It's a whole lot easier to slip a piece of plastic down and let it run through and let the charges go up as opposed to handing the cash out of our own purse or our own wallet and watching it leave our presence. That makes a difference. There was a recent study that showed that 47% more uh, money was spent at McDonald's when a card was used rather than cash. Because you don't feel the cash, or you don't feel the card, you feel the cash. Uh, we need to use cash. We need to save. We need to invest in our futures. And finally, and this is the one that uh, some people think, well, no, yeah, here we are at the church, and the church is going to harp on this. We need to be givers. We need to be givers. Over in Malachi chapter 3, at the end of your Old Testament, there is uh, the, the story of uh, oh, let's see here. Like I said, I hadn't, I hadn't, uh, I hadn't pre marked these, I knew they were all over. In Malachi chapter 3, we have uh, the, the story of people who thought they were doing things the right way, and Malachi as a prophet was saying, no, God's not happy with anything you're doing. Even though it looks good, he's not happy with what you're doing because it's not from your heart. It's outward. It's a show. And in Malachi chapter 3, and in verse 10, we have, uh, let me back up and back up to, to uh, verse 8, because this is where it starts. Malachi asked the question, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, therefore, and there will be food for my house. Test me in this and see, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessings that you will not have room enough for it. Test me. This is the only time that God told these people to put them to the test. You remember one of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not test the Lord thy God. Right? We're not to put him to a test. Except here. Test God and see. If you give to him, he will be sure your needs are cared for. And uh, there are examples all through our lives of generous things people have done for others. And we, we have those things that have happened to us. I shared that with you. Uh, just uh, what happened in the interim period between our leaving Indiana and coming here. And out of the blue, a check arrived from Bob Russell Ministries. People who have the money and can use the money and can use it for God's glory and can give it with joy. And things are blessed. Now, we have to understand this. God doesn't need our money. He doesn't need. First of all, it's his money. And God just doesn't need our money. What he needs is our hearts. He's concerned about us, not our pocketbooks. He needs us to have an attitude of giving, and an attitude of selflessness, and an attitude of love, and an attitude of responsibility. He's trying to change the person we see in the mirror. He's trying to make a difference in that person's life. He has a game plan. He has something good he wants to do for his kids. He wants to give us more, but we have to handle what we have now. And as we do that, God can start opening the gates of his blessings. Now, I'm not saying he's going to make a search. Believe me, I'm not a Christian who says that if you do everything God wants you to do, he is going to give you health and wealth and you won't have any problems the rest of your life. I can't say that because there are Christians over in Iraq that are living for Christ.
Christ and then die. I can't say that because the Apostle Paul himself bore on his body the marks of Jesus. And if there was ever anyone who lived for God, it was the Apostle Paul. He didn't have health and wealth and a good time. But he had a relationship with God. It's what God wants. And if our relationship is with this world, our relationship is going to be with our, with our wallets, with our checkbooks, with our bank accounts, with our, with our, our pocketbooks. If our relationship is with God, then all these things will fall into place. All these things weave together. God's way of handling money, God's ways of handling money works every time. Uh, but there's going to be some bumps in the road. There's going to be some difficulties. We have bumps in our lives. But those bumps help us to pay attention to the one we're following. So, if we do these kind of things, if we live by these five principles, the world's going to make fun of us. Because that's not the normal way of doing things. But I want you to understand something. Christians are to live like no one else. We're not to live like the world. We are to live like no one else. And so we need to start that process by being good stewards of whatever God has given us. Large or small. We need to be stewards of what He has given us. In Hebrews 12, 11, the Hebrew author said, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but it's painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So, as we give ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, we also have to give this to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We have to surrender those things that the world says is so much higher and so much important than church stuff. No, Jesus is highest and He is the most important. And as we seek Him, everything else will fall. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness.